tonight about banking, particularly to that great majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days, why it was done, and what the next steps are going to be. By 1934, the New Deal was starting to work. Old man depression, if not yet licked, was on the run. But just as the economy began swinging back, came the first major revolt. Most of the big business leaders and nearly all the social elite turned on the New Deal. And not only that, they became rabid Roosevelt haters and began to spread the vilest rumors about me and my wife. <laughs> As one of our wits put it, a vast bitterness is welling up from the grassroots of every country club in America. <laughs> in part, this desertion of the wealthy was due merely to returning prosperity. As these economic royalists began coming out of their storm shelters, they forgot there'd ever been a storm and began to demand an end to all government regulation. But it was more than this. They turned on the New Deal because it was undermining their position, the position of those we're now coming to call white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. You see, before the New Deal, they owned while others rented. They loaned while others borrowed. They hired while others took jobs. New Deal was undermining this, and, and I, well, I became a traitor to my class. It was in large part this desertion of business which brought about the second or reform phase of the New Deal. Also, the voiding of the NRA by the Supreme Court, a court composed of old men hopelessly out of touch with the times. Well, this forced us to rethink our position with regard to labor. But, but it was not just that conservative desertion freed us for more democratic policy, no. I'll have to admit to you that the challenge of the populist left, Father Charles Coughlin and Francis Townsend and Huey Long, also pushed us in that direction. <laughs> Huey Long, the Louisiana kingfish, was the leader of this group and one of the most bizarre figures ever to sit in the Senate. He was also one of the most brilliant More men are now out of work than ever. The debt of the United States has gone up 10 billion more dollars. There is starvation, there is homelessness, there is misery on every hand and corner. But mind you, in the meantime, Mr. Roosevelt has had his way. He's one man that can't blame any of his troubles on you at all. He's had his way. Back down in my part of the country, if any man has the measles, he blames that on me. But there's one man that can't blame anything on anybody but himself, and that's Mr. Frank Brondell and all those of them. <laughs> As Kentucky Senator Albin Barkley put it, Huey Long was the smartest lunatic he ever saw in his life. <laughs> but he was also a dangerous man. For his share our wealth program, seemed to have enough popular support either to get him elected president in 1936 or ensure victory by the Republicans. Seemingly, the only way to derail him, we thought, was to pass laws that would steal his thunder. And in this regard, the two most important of our New Deal reforms were the Wagner Labor Law and the Social Security Act. Now, I had long supported the idea of collective bargaining and the principles of social insurance. Those political pressures from Long and the others 
simply showed me the time had come to implement them. For you see, whenever a leader, whenever enough people indicate they want a thing badly, it is the leader's obligation to give them a measure of satisfaction. Now, the Wagner Act, which guaranteed to workers the rights to freely organize and to bargain collectively, was perhaps our most radical law. For by giving great economic and political power to organized labor, it changed American politics in a quite fundamental way. It also cut right to the heart of labor management relations by forcing employers to follow rules of elemental fairness in dealing with workers. 